this evening we have a very uh, special panel event on the topic of women in the boardroom. Uh, and as well as our fantastic speakers, we're also very lucky to have with us this evening um, our Provost and Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Jill Valentine, who will be chairing the session for us. So a warm welcome to you, Jill, and I'll, I'll hand over to you to introduce our panel. Thanks very much, Lizzie. And just to say a huge and warm welcome to everybody to this Women in the Boardroom event. I mean, as a, as a, a woman and a, a leader myself, I think this is a really fantastic opportunity, actually, to, to hear from uh, three such distinguished alumna and to learn from the leadership skills, particularly to the, obviously for, for the women students amongst us. And I also want to start by saying a huge congratulations to all of the students joining this session because it's just been such a such a hugely competitive process so you've done fantastically well to be selected uh, to, to take part in this really exclusive event and I hope that tonight's events and the and the other events will help you develop your leadership skills and go on to forge hugely successful careers and perhaps in in you know 20 or 30 years time some of you might be coming back in some whatever new social media platforms exist in those days <laughs> share your uh, learning experiences too. So as I say, we've got three fantastic, really distinguished uh, alumni uh, to talk to us tonight. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce who's Executive Vice Chair at MasterCard and Co-Chair of the 30%. He uses Chair of Bristol Living um, and ex-Chair of Aston Martin and uh, Alison Kay, who's Chair of Global Accounts at Ernst & Young. Um, so what I'm going to do is ask each of the panellists to give a brief intro to their paths to date to start with. So um, can I start with um, with you first, uh, Anne? Um, uh, so over to you, Anne Kent. Yes, thank you. Great. Well, um, I was in Sheffield. I graduated in 1978, so quite a long time ago. And I studied maths there and went on to do a master's degree in Newcastle and then became a research scientist for British Gas uh, and an engineer, and I worked on the offshore oil rigs. Um, and, uh, and I actually moved out of that into banking uh, in my 30s. I joined Citibank uh, when I joined the investment bank at a time that there was one of the biggest stock market crashes in the world. Um, and then from that, I actually moved on um, it stayed in banking about 20 years until I moved into restructuring during the second big financial crisis, which was in 2008. And um, coming out of that, I actually led Lehman Brothers uh, through, the through their Chapter 11, which is their bankruptcy. And then I joined MasterCard and ran international, everything around the world except the United States. So it was called Head of International, which is about 200 countries. And... After that, uh, I, I moved in to be vice chair of MasterCard, which gives me more time to do external work, such as run the 30% Club, which is an organization that campaigns to get more than 30% women in the boardroom. And we're very proud to have 33% women in the FTSE, one, FTSE 350 boardrooms as we sit today. But the 30% Club is in... 14 countries around the world, including Japan, Brazil, South Africa, Hong Kong, the United States, Canada, and I could go on. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of room to improve where women are, both in the corporate boardrooms, actually in corporations themselves, and across the world in society. I'll just end by saying I attend the World Economic Forum every year. And when I went to Davos this year, um, we were told that things were moving backwards and it would now take 257 years for women to reach economic empowerment at the same level as men, which is clearly unacceptable, and quite bizarre. It's like telling someone in the American Revolution it's going to be OK when we reach 2020, <laughs> just to put it in perspective. So, uh, so, yes, that's what I'd like to start with. That, that's truly shocking, Anne, actually, um, and something perhaps we might want to come back to in the discussion a, a bit later on. Um, so can I ask Penny Hughes now, living, um, uh, to give her brief self-introduction? Sure. So I graduated um, in 1980, uh, which also feels quite a long time ago, in chemistry. 
And actually, um, I, I really do credit the careers um, leader at Sheffield with starting my career in the right direction, um, a man called Bernard Kingston, who led careers for a very long time at Sheffield. And I'd already started to get itchy feet about being a scientist and wanted to be more commercial. And he said, well, go and join Procter & Gamble. They are a very commercial organization, but start as a product development chemist because that's what you're good at. So that's what I did. Um, and we were both right because it was a brilliant place to start. But it did show me that although I enjoyed being a product development chemist for them, really, I wanted to be in sales and marketing. And so um, obviously they're a great business for sales and marketing, but they said, that's fine, Penny, but now you've got to start again after two years. <laughs> and of course, if I look back now, two years uh, is nothing in a long career, but I was impatient. And so I left Procter & Gamble and I joined the Coca-Cola company then uh, in marketing. Uh, and I was very fortunate. Um, the company reorganized quite a lot of times. I had very good mentors and sponsors. And over 10 years, I went from being basically a marketing assistant to being president of the company for Coca-Cola Great Britain. Um, first woman running one of the global divisions of the Coca-Cola company and the first one under 40 and I was 32 at the time. So it was really that period at, at Coke that really shaped my, my career. Um, I then really sort of was at a, a bit of a crossroads because I got married and we were having children and the only other jobs inside Coke that were bigger um, were places they were not going to put a British woman. So Japan was a bigger market, Germany was a bigger market, and the US weren't going to put a British woman in any of those markets. So I was likely to have to go and sit on the 20th floor in Atlanta, which is where head office was. And that just wasn't attractive at 32. So for all sorts of both career and personal family reasons, um, I embarked on what is now a plural career where I will work with uh, a number of businesses on the board as an independent director. Um, I've now, I think, covered about 15 or 16 different companies. Um, I start in companies where, had I stayed an executive, I might have run them. So The Body Shop, William Morrison Supermarkets, um, The Gap, Argos, so consumer brands. Uh, I then also added uh, technology. Um, I had a fantastic 10 years with Vodafone. When I first joined the board, we had less than customers. And when I left 10 years later, we had 125 million customers. So really saw the whole explosion of mobile telephony. Um, and then into banking. So both uh, Scandinavian and Skilda Bank and the Swedish Bank. And then 10 years uh, with Royal Bank of Scotland, Ligan, picking up the pieces post financial crisis. So um, I have more recently got into property. So I'm still um, chair of IQSA. Some of you might even live with us in student in, in Sheffield. I think we've got rooms for about a thousand people in Sheffield. Uh, and um, also now Riverstone, which is really building retirement communities. Um, so a plural career with a, a sort of great breadth of different sectors and segments. I've really enjoyed putting some not-for-profit work together as well. Um, so I have been a trustee of the British Museum. That was an extraordinary privilege because that really enabled me to meet with all sorts of different people that I wouldn't meet in, in the business world. So real different diversity and really thinking about the impact of describing cultures and heritage uh, and what that can mean to help us all understand how we live together on the same planet. Uh, also president of the Advertising Association, which really um, manages the rights and responsibilities of advertising. And then um, currently I am uh, chair of a, um, a school, so was chair at King's College Wimbledon uh, here in the UK. And now I, um, our sort of sister school in Thailand, which is opening in about two weeks time. So that's quite exciting too. So that's also sort of connects me back into education, which um, I really love. So that's me. Penny, I'm exhausted just listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope later on we might probe you about the secret of uh, how you obviously managed to create time because I, I just uh, think, for, well, for all of you, but particularly through that description, um, how you managed to pack so much <laughs> in is um, impressive. And certainly to have worked in so many different sectors, it, it must be really... Uh, really unusual uh, and, and hopefully we can explore some of that with you a bit, bit later on thank you i should just also say your video great thank was you. cutting in and out we could hear you perfectly but your your video seemed to cut in and out okay i'm going to turn my video off
in a minute. And if anybody else who's not speaking could do as well, because I think if we have le less videos, um, then then it, this, hopefully the system might might be able to support um, the pictures of the, the speaker better. If, not being a technical person. Um, so thank you ever so much. So we can move um, now to Alison, Chair of Global Council at Ernst & Young. Thank you, Jill. And, and gosh, yeah, I, I echo your sentiments. I, I think I'm also uh, uh, in awe, uh, Penny and Anne, of, of the careers that you, you've, uh, you've had. Uh, I actually graduated from Sheffield in 1992. I studied geography at Sheffield. Uh, and in fairness, um, I did not have a very clear view of the career path I wanted to follow uh, post-university. I thoroughly enjoyed the subject, um, but it didn't necessarily lead to a very clear career path. I joined uh, United Utilities actually on the uh, graduate training scheme after university. It was a general management uh, graduate training scheme. Uh, they put me through my MBA. So I studied at Manchester Business School part time uh, in, my, in my MBA. Uh, and I had a great mentor there and he actually advised me uh, after probably four years on that scheme uh, to move into consulting. Um, his, uh, his view was that if I went into consulting, I would get a breadth of um, you know, experiences and then I would be able to sort of rejoin industry uh, should I want to at that point. So I actually took the plunge. I moved to London. Uh, I actually moved to Accenture or Anderson Consulting as it was then. Uh, where I made partner at the age of 32 um, and then um, you know we had a great career there and then moved to Ernst Young or EY uh, as it is now known uh, 16 years ago um, so in EY I joined as a direct admit partner to build out the consulting business uh, there um, and I've been there ever since I spent seven years in the UK and then I was invited to be the uh, global vice chair for industry um, which was a role that took on 17 sectors um, across all our services. So audit, tax, our transactions and mergers business, as well as our consulting business. So it took in the breadth of our business globally. Uh, we have 280,000 people um, in uh, EY uh, globally. So I've had a fantastic time over the last seven years. Uh, two years ago, I was invited to join the global executive of EY. Uh, where I've been running our largest accounts, or our largest uh, 300 accounts, um, of which those have had about 11 billion of revenue sitting within those accounts. So I've had a great opportunity to run um, run those accounts and uh, be global and um, work across the globe. Um, I've had the privilege of being um, able to, you know, engage with uh, colleagues and businesses uh, around the world, uh, from Japan to China, to uh, the US, to Africa, Middle East, um, Europe, everywhere. So that's been great. In the last, actually, a uh, few months, I've taken a role which is, uh, the title um, is Managing Partner of Client Service. And it's a rather strange title uh, for those not in partnerships. Uh, it's effectively running now our UK and Ireland business. Um, with the aim of really uh, transforming that into a digital and technology business over the course of the next uh, few years. So um, recently taken on a new role in the UK. So it's been a, a fantastic career um, uh, to date and um, you know, thoroughly enjoyed uh, every aspect of it. Um, so um, yeah, uh, Jill, over to you. Thank you. I mean, as a fellow geographer, it's, it's fantastic to hear um, that some of our, our geography graduates have gone on to such impressive heights. So uh, uh, that's something hopefully the geography department, we can work uh, to bring you in touch with them. Um, and I guess one of the other things that struck me about all of your introductions is how you were all successful so early in your careers. And I think sometimes, it, you know, when graduates are looking at, um, at uh, people's success. I think sometimes there's an expectation it takes a long time to be very successful. I think what's so impressive about all three of you, and perhaps we can have some insights from you later, is how, how, how successful you were so quickly and so early, and, um, and how you were able to sort of grow and diversify your, your career through a number of phases. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so we've got lots to reflect on and talk about. So, so thank you all for sharing your kind of personal biographies and um, how, how you've come to be where you are. Um, what we're going to do now is move on to the kind of in conversation section. So we've got some topics, um, uh, three different topics relating to female leadership. Um, and, and I'm going to kind of pose a different question to you each. Um, and hopefully um, you can share your thoughts uh, with this. So, so firstly, if I can direct this, this question to, to Anne Cairns. Anne, um, 
What do you think are the most important attributes of female leadership? Well, uh, I actually think that in terms of leadership in general, um, one of the most important attributes is the ability to communicate well with people and to actually have empathy with them. Empathy is a much used word these days. And I think from the female perspective, we've read a lot in the press about you know, empathetic political female leaders. For example, the, the head of uh, New Zealand comes to mind as somebody who's managed very well during the COVID crisis and managed very well uh, when she had that terrible shooting in Christchurch and managed to appeal to her whole country in a very good way. Um, and I think it's really that attribute of putting yourself in the shoes of the other person and being able to explain to people from a communication point of view very simply and easily what you would like them to do. And if I take another political um, view on that, then I would say if we look at what the way that Angela Merkel has again responded in the COVID crisis in Germany, laying out a very simple plan about how she wanted to manage the country, what she expected people to do in terms of wearing masks, how they ran the testing programs. And she is a chemist herself, but she just put it in very simple terms compared with, for example, the chaos that's actually going on over in the United States right now. So, um, so those are two things I would say, empathy and really simple and good communication skills. And can I open that up to, to Penny and Alison to join in the conversation? I mean, are those um, uh, attributes that, that you think are key, key as well? Or I mean, do you have alternative ones that, that, you, uh, that you might want to, to pitch in? So, um, and I don't know if you've seen, I, I received a WhatsApp a few days ago, um, which said, it's got pictures of um, political leaders. Uh, and what do these political leaders have in common? USA, Brazil, Russia, Spain, UK, Italy, France. They're mm -hmm. all at the bad league for COVID and are all run by men. And the, the other list, Germany, Taiwan, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, Norway, and Denmark, they're all at the top and they're all run by women. So I think that's game over. <laughs> and, and also, I mean, I think there's a lot of evidence that the, um, the lack of diversity in some of the most important financial institutions led to the global financial crisis because there was no ability to think differently or to project differently. Uh, or, you know, because they'd all come from this. I mean, I think even um, the Fed, uh, the 12 man body was 12 men from two schools. Um, and, you know, of course, you get um, silo thinking, you know, just the, the following thinking. So I think what um, female leadership is about bringing a different perspective. Um, and I often say to people that I work with, look, you know, particularly when the kids were younger, they're not, they're, they're, they've are they grown up now. But when the kids were younger, I used to say to them, look, if it bothers you that when you call, you might get my five-year-old on the phone, then that's kind of your problem rather than mine, because you have to take me as I am and the whole of me. And I've always tried to help people understand that, you know, having business meetings at 7.30 when the school run is on, is not a good idea. Let, let's be thoughtful about making work fit into other people's lifestyles. And I, I think men finding that harder, but learning. Um, but for women, that comes, I think, more naturally. I think the other skill that women have genuinely is the ability to juggle. Um, because in many ways, we've been sleep deprived, you know, when you have children, and you get used to how that feels, and you still feel as though you need to fill your day with everything else. And uh, that natural sort of nurturing that women have, which means that you do take on many different jobs, actually is a real asset in, in leadership terms. Do you think, I, some... I, you know, I... sorry, Jill. Sorry, I was, just, I was just going to, you speak first and then I'll ask my question afterwards. So... I was just going to reinforce the, the, the point around authenticity uh, and, you know, and, and certainly, you know, acknowledging that um, we all have a life outside uh, the, this, the, the business world and that, you know, that is actually a perfectly acceptable um, place to be. I have two young children, a 12 year old and a six year old. And, 
you know, for me, I think it has been, um, you know, a real journey uh, as you go through this. But I think the authenticity of leadership is something that is coming more and more to the fore and is more and more expected, actually, by people of, of the, the, the generation of, of students that we have here and, and younger, that, you know, and I think social media has brought that into sharp relief as well, that if you are not an authentic leader, it is pulled out very, very uh, quickly. I also think women bring a, a real element of teaming. And, you know, I guess it builds a little bit penny to, to the point you made around, you know, how women can, can sort of, uh, the diversity in, in any team is important. But I do think that, you know, this aspect that every voice matters in a team and that the diversity of the team is, is critical. Uh, and that, you know, breaking down silos in business that I, I feel have contributed to some of the failings that we've seen in many businesses. Uh, and bringing this, you know, breaking through those silos is something that I think women do incredibly well uh, and, and work across businesses in a more sort of fluid and more networked way and bringing the team together. So I think, you know, from my perspective, that, that those are some of the, the, the attributes in addition to what Penny and Anna have shared. And I guess the things that you've, you've all highlighted in terms of, you know, empathy, authenticity, multitasking. I mean, do you think those things are now valued in organisations? I mean, clearly the three of you have all been phenomenally successful. But, but do you think more broadly, in, you know, in, when, when people are assessing graduates for graduate entry, when people are, you know, the way, the way organisations are now increasingly operating and working, do you think these female attributes have, have really been embraced and understood? Um, or, or is it that people have been successful employing them, but there's things that, that, that still all the companies and so on aren't properly valuing or recognising in, in, in the way they work? From my perspective and where we are in, in our recruitment, these are critical attributes. Um, you know, I, um, I recall going to a client pitch um, a number of years ago, actually, and a competitor turned up with five white men um, to the pitch and the client refused to actually take them into that pitch and, and, uh, and, and, and kind of effectively threw them out of the room and for me it's not just a nice thing to do it is a business critical whether that's sort of working through the, the, the you know um, the points around you know bank failures historically um, but you know I know in our own business we would not be successful if we did not embrace all forms of diversity and you know that includes um, you know that the skills and attributes that, that women bring uh, in, into into the team. So, um, you know, it, our business is embracing them. If they're not, they're not going to be successful, in my in my view. I, I think I, agree. I think that most firms today, you know, they would feel really bad about recruiting more men than women. Uh, you know, I don't. I've not really talked to any firm that says I'm not trying to hit 50 50 at an entry level. Most firms have something like, you know, a much lower percentage of women at the top, that's for sure. But they start off at an entry level that's 50-50. And one would hope, because that's their starting point today, that we'll see more women climbing up the ladder in the future and not dropping out at a certain rate. What we've seen, though, is actually that that first step on the management ladder is actually a big step for women to take. That's where men have been accelerating and women have been stepping back. And it can be for all sorts of reasons. Penny was talking earlier about decisions that she'd taken. Well, maybe not the first step in the ladder, but it was a more junior step, Penny, than you, you, know, than you eventually were, of course. And, uh, and I think that we have to pay special attention at that level. But I think in terms of university recruitment, you, know, you should expect that there will be a level playing field and companies should be using gender neutral techniques to recruit and even blind recruitment where they actually don't know the gender of the person that they're, you know, they're recruiting when they're doing their shortlisting. Obviously, you're going to know it at interview, but, you know, all and the questions they ask should be balanced as well. So there shouldn't be any problem right now in today's world. I'm not saying that, 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 that it's going to be perfect, but that's the, that's the plan. I think that's right. I mean, we, we three all come from, um, you know, highly respected organisations um, and practice in the FTSE 100 is better than practice in FTSE 250. And that's better than in small businesses. And largely it's better than in privately owned businesses. So, um, you know, I think the, the, the realistic piece is 
for for sure large companies will absolutely spend time getting this right um but we you know we don't all uh, you know there's plenty of employment in smaller businesses so we have to keep getting it right everywhere there's there's two words i suppose that in my last 20 years you know at the beginning were not in the boardroom and now are absolutely permanent in the boardroom and that's culture and sustainability uh and you know businesses all, all investors all stakeholders in a business all contribute to wanting to have businesses you know with a good culture you can see the uproar uh, with the issues that boohoo are being you know accused of and that will seriously hurt their reputation both as an employer and as a as a brand and so they've now got to go to you know strong efforts to demonstrate uh, their credentials both in culture and sustainability so the, these you know i i think there is a a, a much more um ready conversation uh, around all of these issues and i'm an optimist like anne i feel that if we start businesses as gender balanced then we've got a much better chance through these years of making the change and we've made significant progress you know at some levels in organizations and and now we need to make sure that we're giving the right environment culture encouragement to women to succeed and do you think the culture of your organizations is changing because because you've all talked about you know these attributes like empathy and um uh you know and um agile ways of working and being able to juggle things is really important attributes that women bring um but but do you think there's a becoming a feminization of business culture are those now do you think attributes that are embraced by businesses generally and not necessarily recognized as something that 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 women bring do you see what i mean i mean do you think there is a, a cultural shift in organizations so I, I was lucky enough to be a director of the Gap in San Francisco for eight years. So I'd go across to San Francisco eight times a year. And whenever I'd arrive, um, you know, lunch would be laid out and lunch would be the most extraordinary diverse offering because at Gap, um, basically white male straight was almost extinct. So this was an extraordinary diverse employee base. And so um, vegan, you know, everything. And this is like 10 years ago before other companies even started thinking about how might we treat our employees for their differences. And so I, I would say that the, you know, that is definitely coming more normal in the UK that we are accepting differences. Uh, not quite celebrating differences, but accepting differences. And, uh, you know, there's more to do, but um, I'm, I'm optimistic. Yeah, I completely agree with Penny on that. And I would say, obviously, I'm from a big consumer brand as well, working for MasterCard. And we've been doing things such as uh, true name cards where people who are transgender uh, in the past, they've had to use their original name because that's what the banks insist on. And now we brought out cards that, you know, if they change, they can actually just change to whichever name they wish to be called by. And this seems like a small thing, but of course, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing in terms of personal identity. So when you're actually in a consumer brand, I think, you know, you're there to recognize you're there to serve everyone on the planet. And it does make you think about being inclusive. Um, and and the, there's obviously two things here, diversity and inclusion, but inclusion is really important. You, you know, you can't have, you know, you could, you could have a diverse team, but unless you, you know, you actually started reaching out and including everybody in the decision-making process, you're not really causing the change. And, um, and so you have to focus on both of those things. Now, if you're a global business as we are, then um, you look at the management team, for example, of MasterCard. Well, on the management team, we've got, you know, Brazilians, Italians, um, Chinese, Indian, um, you know, uh, different nationalities from around the world. I'm one of the few Europeans, quite honestly. I'm not even a European, I'm a Brit, you know, no, <laughs> just joking. But uh, <laughs> sadly, sadly, we'll be having breakfast, 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 breakfast soon. <laughs> um, 
So uh, I, you know, I think that as a global business, it's obvious that you need people with different ethnicities, different ways of thinking, you know, and um, and different genders in order to be sure that you're serving your client base and representing the thinking of your client base around the world. We've got like two billion people that use our products and services. Um, so it naturally drives you in that direction. And yes, to your question, Jill, then I think that what happens is your culture has all of those features that we were talking about. Whether that's the feminization of culture, it, it may be. Um, and, uh, and included in that, of course, is an increase in the number of women that you have as a senior, at a senior level. We have something like 30% um, of women, so it seems a magic number these days, doesn't it? 30% that are executive vice president and above, which basically means the top echelons of the company. Now we'd like to be 50, by the way. Um, so there's much more to do there. And I think, you know, just building on that, Jill, I, the, you know, in, in EY, when I joined the UK uh, 16 years ago, only 11% of the partnership were female. Um, today, you know, every year we have our global um, meeting where we, we invite and celebrate all our new partners. And for the last three, four years, it's been up to 30% of all the partners have been uh, female, so the new admit. So we have put very clear targets in place. And whilst not everybody likes targets, I do think they can make a big shift in, 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 in how you would achieve, you know, the goals that you're looking to achieve. My personal view is that I think that the technology revolution that we're in the midst of, and I think COVID will also push this even further and faster, is that businesses have no option but to change or they will die. Um, you know, I think the, the the changes that are upon us as a society, the changes that are upon us from how businesses have to operate and adapt and, and learn, that for me is a real uh, game changer when it comes to diversity at all levels of an organisation. Because if, if we don't create, if businesses do not create that diversity in the working practices and the environments for for equality in our, how everybody can be successful, I just don't think they will survive uh, in the long term. I'm not saying they'll go out of business tomorrow, but I think in the next 10 years, we will really uh, shine a light on businesses that have not adapted. And that for me includes also the diversity agenda as well. Thank you. Um, should we move on to, to the next topic then? Um, uh, Penny, can I direct this question to you first, but then obviously open it up to, to Anne and Alison to come in with, with their reflections too. Um, so, so far we've talked largely about success, but can I flip it round and ask you, what challenges have you faced on, 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 your, on your road to success? And what are your top tips to um, the graduates uh, joining us this evening in how to overcome them? So I think you get challenged early on in confidence. You know, do I really have the skills and the um, wherewithal to take on the kind of responsibilities that businesses were, were, were giving? Um, you know, I became a commercial director of Coca-Cola at 28 and I was then selling to the sales directors of Tesco, Sainsbury, all the major supermarkets, beer companies and so forth. And these were all men in their 50s. Um, and the challenge was, you know, am I up to being able to manage a negotiation with people that are, you know, of a different generation? Um, and I suppose, how did I overcome those? I had brilliant mentors and sponsors who just gave me the confidence and the support and the backing and indeed would sit with me in gameplay um, how these conversations might go and, and in that way really help train and develop me. And so I've always kept a fairly wide network of people that I can just go and talk to when I'm not quite sure what decision to take or whether I'm taking what, a decision too fast, people that I can just call and talk it through. And normally I come away just more confident in the decision that I was going to take in the first place, but really pleased to have been able to talk it through. So I think it is um, build your confidence by having a good network. Uh, I encourage reverse mentoring in most of the businesses that I'm involved with. 
that means that leaders get mentored by people like students on the call today because no leader you know has all the answers and can often learn by having someone from a different generation talk to them and so reverse mentoring as well as having your own mentors and sponsors i guess the other thing that i've always felt in in putting a career together is um i call it work life fit because i think work life balance is a is is a little tricky to find <laughs> but work life fit in other words that you're happy that you've put your together your life in a way that suits you and you know you can manage all your responsibilities so i always say to people please don't carry on doing a job if it doesn't make you happy i think that's an absolute you know you've got to be able to turn up to work every day really enjoying the people that you work with really enjoying the responsibilities you've got and therefore able to absolutely bring your best self to work so um, make sure you've got a good network make sure you feel happy in the responsibilities you take uh, and be confident because you've probably got it right i guess the last thing that i used to do at coke in particular um in in sort of when we were looking at uh, reviewing performance with people i always used to say look let's celebrate success but let's celebrate failure too, because actually it's important that people really push the boundaries and sometimes fail, because that's actually where you know that someone is really, really going, you know, that step beyond the norm. And so I like hearing of things that haven't gone quite as well as people thought, and then helping them recover from that and find out ways of doing it better next time. Thank you. Did, did either of you want to come in, um, uh, Alison or, or Anne, before? I thought... Sure, I mean, I, I build on the, I mean, the mentor point is, is, is a critical point, I think. Uh, having a, a really good mentor through one's career is, is, is really critical. And sponsorship as well, so people who will, um, you know, sponsor you through. I think I would say um, being bold at times, taking a risk, it, it might not seem the most... Um, Easiest challenge to do, I, I reflect back myself, um, you know, when I took on the role of vice chair for industry globally, my son was only seven months old at the time. And, um, you know, I was I, I was very much in, you know, gosh, am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to be able to take on a global role where I, you know, I'm expected to travel? Um, and I, I spoke to my then boss and I said, look, let me just be really clear. You know, I've got a seven month old child. If you expect me to be on a plane, uh, four weeks a month then this role is not for me but you know I can commit to travel but I need to put the boundaries in around my my home life and you know in fairness to her it, uh, she was like no absolutely you know you can you can make this work um, and you know I um, you know put, put, put a lot of thoughts into it spoke to my family but you know went for it and when my attitude was well like if I don't give it a go I'll never know but if you give it a go and it doesn't work out, then fine, go 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 try something else. So I I do believe in taking some risks, even when those risks seem somewhat challenging and somewhat sort of uh, insurmountable at times. And I do also believe in having the conversations and the open conversations, and, and you know, I guess reinforcing the points that Penny made, which is be clear what you want out of it and how you think you can do the work life uh, flex. Uh, and if that's not good enough for that particular role or that particular organisation, then don't take it. Um. Well, I would say, um, you know, building on both what Alison and Penny have said, I want to pick up a point about uh, Alison saying, be bold. And this was also Penny had said, you know, have confidence in yourself. And uh, these two things are very related. And I have a sort of funny story from when I left engineering, I became a banker. And I went into the dealing room environment and um, my boss at the time uh, didn't want a woman reporting to him running a division. Um, and uh, he never even invited me to the management committee, you know, meetings. He would just walk past me in the morning, go into his glass office and slam the door. And that was that. And I'd been there about, I don't know, six weeks. And I was in more of an open plan environment. And sitting behind screens and I couldn't see my staff that were, you know, I had a number of staff reporting to me that, that were sitting in front of me. So I thought to myself, should I order glass screens? Because I would really love to see people in the mornings when I come in, well, in fact, all day. 
And then I thought, should I go and ask Frank? That was my boss. Should I ask him if I can order glass screens? And then I thought, well, he doesn't even speak to me. So why should I ask him, right? So what I did was I just, you know, raised an order through the procurement department and ordered myself these glass screens. Well, funny thing happened was three weeks later, the screens arrive. I walk into the bank, sit down at my desk. Everybody else starts turning up in the dealing room and people are walking past the screens and looking at me. He walks into <laughs> the bank. He, he walks past me slams the door, looks out of his office window at these screens. Nobody says anything. And then <laughs> two days later, I get invited to the management meeting. And what, <laughs> and what had happened was two things. One was that he realized that whether he said something to me or not, I was just going to make my own decisions. And so, you know, I was strong enough, therefore, to join his management team. The second thing is because I'd ordered glass screens and remember this is 1987. So it was like Wolf of Wall Street. You must have been promoted. So my entire department thought I'd gone up a level in the bank and was even more senior. <laughs> and all because I just had decided I wanted to see people. <laughs> <laughs> So, so my thing, uh, two pieces of advice on this was be bold, decide what you think the right action is and, and take it because often it is the right action. As Penny said, when she asked for advice, she usually came back to taking the action that she wanted to. And to Alison's point, I was unhappy sitting behind these other screens. So I took some action that made me happy. And the third thing I'd say is, look, if your boss doesn't rate you and he doesn't think you're great, then get a new boss. <laughs> you know? Because there is no point sitting in a job working for somebody that's just making your life awful. Just move on because that person decides your bonus, they decide your promotion, they, they ultimately decide the, the steps that you take and don't put yourself in a position where you sit there doing nothing putting up with bad management. So, um, yeah, that's my advice. <laughs> so, and you remind me uh, of a, a, a very, uh, it's a quick story. I was, um, when I joined RBS, um, not many women in the investment bank, as you would be not surprised. So I said, look, I would like to mentor and sponsor some of the women in the bank. So could I, you know, gather, could you gather them and I'll have a breakfast or lunch, if I remember. And um, anyway, some very impressive women turned out. However, they had three nannies each because they all had, they, they worked such long hours. So they had sort of nannies that rotated every eight hours. And I said, I'm really sorry, but this isn't female, you know, leadership role, role management because this is unattainable for the majority. And these women are actually just behaving like men. And that's not really about diversity or inclusion. <laughs> so yeah. we've come some distance. <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite. <laughs> I mean, I think we, we, there's some great stories uh, around. And, you know, if, my, my, my story about, um, actually was, I know it was on the graduate scheme at United Utilities and we were expected to take a tour of duty around each part of the business. So how, how you make clean water, what, where the sewage goes and also how you repair leaks. So I was in Wigan actually uh, doing my tour of duty around leak repair. It was in January, freezing cold, snowing. Um, and of course the, 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 the great thing for these guys was to actually see if they could get a 22 year old graduate trainee to actually do any of the actual work, particularly a woman. So, of course, you know, I was not going to be daunted by the fact that I had to get into a freezing cold hole in the ground uh, full of icy water trying to repair a leak in the middle of January, even though my feet were so numb, I could, you know, I couldn't actually feel them. And this guy walked past, uh, I remember the public, and he looked down and went, a woman? A woman in the hole? What's a woman doing in the hole? Get the woman out of the hole. And uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm perfectly fine, thank you, in the hole. It's, it's all good. It's all good. Um, but I think um, it, it certainly taught me resilience. And I do think you have to have resilience, uh, uh, whether you're male, female or whatever. And, you know, you do have to have resilience in your career. Things don't get handed to you. 
But I, what that also gave me a true appreciation of, which has never left me, is that in any organisation, there are people out there who are doing some extremely tough jobs. And they're at the coal face of most organisations. They're the ones facing into the customers. Um, and those are the ones who we really should be celebrating in life. And I think, um, you know, as a, as a journey, as a young graduate, it taught me some incredibly valuable lessons about the importance of when you get into the senior roles in any organisation, never, ever, ever forget. Uh, the people who are actually, you know, doing uh, the tough work in many of our businesses. So, I love that a woman in a hole. <laughs> a woman in a hole. What's the woman doing in the hole? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the point you made there, about Alison, about resilience, also trying to the things that Anne and Penny were saying earlier. But can, can I pick you up? I guess. Because, um, you know, you've all talked about being confident in how you've managed your, your work, uh, work patterns and so on. But what happens when things go wrong? I mean, can you give us any examples of how you've dealt, dealt with failure? Because, of course, people's careers are never kind of smooth up or trajectory. There's always things that go wrong. And, and I guess that the other element of failure is also sometimes when you get very competitive colleagues who are competing for promotion or, you know, not colleagues are not if sometimes they're in direct competition with you. So I wonder if, if any of you or all of you might share your reflections on how you've overcome failure um, and, and, and or how you've dealt with situations where your own colleagues actually have potentially been trying to backstab, undermine you. You know, how, how you deal with some of those inter-workplace inter uh, kind of challenges. Yes, well, I was, uh, I was in my mid-30s when I had my first 360-degree feedback um, inside Citibank, and I was very shocked uh, at what I, what I got because it turned out that my staff liked me a lot. Um, I was basically in the financial institutions group at this stage and selling. I had a team of about 350 people across Europe that sold our products to other banks. And then my team loved me. My boss seemed to love me. But my, um, my peer group just really disliked me, right? And uh, I count that as a failure. That's pretty bad. Right? When I mean my peer group, so I would be the head of sales. You would have a head of product, the person developing the products. You would have a head of technology and the person building the things that you were selling. Um, and, um, and, you know, I, I just kind of went like, oh, my God, why do these guys, and they were, they were all guys, why do they dislike me, right? And, and there was two answers to this, and it was quite interesting. One answer was, well, just the thing that, that, that you've said, you know, that um, you're in a competitive environment and your peer group are actually competing against you to a certain extent, even though you're supposed to be working as a team, which is very weird. And, and Penny would definitely know this from the investment banking world. You come across that quite a lot. But the other thing I realized was that um, the style that I had uh, of, uh, of raising things was very challenging. So, you know, for example, I'm out there selling in front of the customer and, you know, the head of technology is supposed to be delivering me something, a payment system, let's say, and it's late by six months or something, quite quite normal. And, um, and I would start feeling very tense about this. <laughs> and I'd start saying to this guy, I'd start trying to tell him how to do his job. You know, <laughs> kind of like, well, why didn't you do extra, you know, user testing in the third phase of the project? Because if you'd done that, then maybe we would have an end product sooner, you know, this kind of thing. And, um, and really, uh, I mean, what a stupid thing to do because all you were doing then was making the guy feel bad and actually he was becoming less and less cooperative about delivering what you, what you needed. So, I mean, complete sort of, I would say, failure of being able to manage people um, who weren't reporting to you. So this kind of lateral management, this persuasive management that you have to develop the higher and higher you go up the ladder. Um, and, uh, and I didn't really see it until it was actually presented to me in black and white that that's what I'm 
going on. And as soon as I saw it, it was so easy to adapt my behavior to actually a, a, engaging with, for example, him much earlier in the process and B, being able to sort of be helpful to him behind the scenes instead of in a kind of confrontational meeting when everything's going wrong in the first place. Um, so it's, it's very good to have a light shone on yourself and to be able to adapt your style. Um, and I did adapt my style so successfully that I, you know, I shot up the management ladder and, and en ended up becoming a head of technology myself and having 6,000 people reporting to me around the world. Uh, uh, but basically because I was able to put myself in the other person's shoes more easily, which is this empathetic female leadership style that we keep talking about. And, and sometimes people don't make that shift. And if you don't make that shift, you're never going to be a senior person in a big corporation because uh, because people won't work with you, quite honestly. So, yeah. That, that's great. I mean, one of my mottos is always find a different way, um, because you know when you when you when you're up against it and you know it's not working, actually just stop, reflect, and find a different way. And so I've often found, um, and actually tech is is a quite familiar sort of territory I think where um, you know you, you things are unpredictable and don't often go the way you wish and therefore can be disappointing um, and so I, I do I have to try and help myself find a different way of influencing of engaging and of finding solutions um, and I suppose it's very disarming when you are competing with someone if you say well, look how can I help you um, because that all of a sudden they realize that actually you are there to help. You're in the same company, you're a part of teamwork and, um, you know, winning together is going to be more powerful for all, for, for, for everyone. But I do, I often write down to myself when I go into a boardroom, find a different way um, because it, it does take innovation to really make a difference in big businesses. Yes, and... Um... I mean, Jill, if I, I reflect on your question about the, you know, is it, you know, the politics and the, you know, the competition and, you know, I, I'm in my, I mean, there's been a number of points in my career where it's been tough, um, particularly tough for me when I took on this vice chair of industry. It was my first foray into a global role. And culturally, um, you know, the ability to really understand the differences across the world um, was something that I was very naive and, and very unfamiliar with at that particular uh, point. Uh, and the environment that we, I went into was um, the majority of the industry leaders, the profile of them, um, of the 17 individuals, uh, I think 14 of them fitted this profile. They were white men in their mid fifties from an audit background. And they were faced with a early, very early forties, female British uh, consulting, um, you know, boss. And they really, really, really disliked it. Dis disliked it to the nth degree. Uh, and because I didn't really know how to engage in that sort of global context at the time, um, I didn't really make enough effort to reach out to them and engage with them up front. So I sort of went about it, right, I've got a job to do, let's get on. And because I did not have the relationship with them, um, they got very upset very, very quickly with me. Um, and they did a huge amount of briefing. And in a partnership, it can be very political. Um, so they did a huge amount of briefing against me, um, you know, to the chairman of the firm globally, to the CEO globally. I mean, it was just sort of... Um, it, 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 it was really incredibly tough. And I would say, um, I guess, two, two big learnings. First of all, relationships matter hugely. Uh, I think in any organisation, I would say particularly a partnership, but um, in any organisation, the relationships you build with people uh, are, are critical um, in terms of being able to engage and to really, I guess, really to the point Tam was making, the empathy, the understanding, the understanding from somebody else's perspective but also, you know, from my, my big learning through that was really to understand different cultures uh, globally, uh, how how they perceive um, 
at different language, different nuances, um, what works, what doesn't work. Um, so I, I would say my, my learning from it was relationships, but also be, be willing to, to really step back and acknowledge you've got a huge amount of development points and learning to do. And uh, in, in order to be successful, we can never stop learning. Brilliant, thank you. I think that, that was all really, really helpful. So I'm just conscious of time, so if I can move us on to the third topic, um, and I guess pose this question first to you, Alison, but then again, ask uh, Anne and Penny to join in with their reflections too. And that's, how can men champion their, their female colleagues? Well, it, it, you know, it's a great question, and I think you've heard from all three three of us that actually men have played a really important part in our, our lives in, you know, in the way in which they have both acted as mentors and sponsors, uh, uh, to certainly uh, to myself. Um, and having men as allies in this cause is, is, uh, is super, super important, you know, really, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, in senior roles in organizations it is still majority men so therefore men leaning in to support women to act as sponsors to act as mentors um is really important but i i also feel very personal it's very personal i guess to me that you know um men as as partners um is also super critical and um, the support at home and how men can support their um, you know their, 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 their other halves in, in their careers is really, really critical. So, you know, I know that without a good level of support from my husband, both support for my career, but support in terms of taking on, you know, equal responsibility around childcare, equal responsibility around, uh, you know, matters of the home, uh, it would have been very, very difficult. And um, so I'm always encouraging, um, you know, men in our organization at senior levels to be role modeling, supporting and acting as mentors, but even at, at more junior levels, I encourage them to take the paternity leave. I encourage them to sort of uh, be out there and, and leave the office uh, early sometimes, you know, to be, to be going picking up children from nursery, et cetera, because I think the more men can role model that, the, the more that women will also not feel as isolated in trying to, um, you know, take on the matters of the home. I, I agree with that, Alison. And I, you know, in MasterCard, we have four months maternity and four months paternity leave everywhere in the world, including for same sex couples, obviously. But uh, but what that does is it creates a business level playing field where you're not looking at a woman and saying, oh, she's going to go and be a mother at some point. You're looking at a young person and saying they're going to be a parent. And that is such a different way to look at things and uh and i do also agree that during all of my career all of my bosses were men still are um that uh they helped me tremendously as had my sponsors um and uh and even going back to the home my father was a great influence on me because he i remember the, the you know the they landed on the moon in 1969 and i was living in a small mining village in the northeast and uh I was, uh, I guess I would be 11 years old. And I went outside and I looked up at the sky and I thought, I want to go to the moon, you know? And I kind of came in and said, dad, I want to be an astronaut, you know? <laughs> and to which he kind of said, yeah, of course you can be an astronaut. You can be anything you want to be, you yeah. know? Now having somebody that loves you, that is a male role model, say that to you, and really mean it is just absolutely fantastic. And he always, and I think that goes to the, the point that Penny was making about the confidence side, that can create fantastic confidence, regardless of which parent or both parents do it for you. But particularly my dad doing it for me made me be that way. And I think he, he really did influence my career, probably much more than he actually realized I didn't become an astronaut, of course, uh, but I did become the first woman offshore on the oil rigs in Britain. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's important. So look, I, I agree with all of that. The only, the only extra thing I would add is that um, these days, um, businesses do lots of um, engagement surveys with their employees um, and you know, there isn't anyone, male or female, that turns around and says, the world's a better place if I'm only working with my single sex, whether it be all women or all men. 
um, you know, we were born to collaborate and have fun together. And it is, it just makes for great, better teams. And so, you know, I think at a very practical level, um, there is real desire for men and women to make um, the, the business environment one which is a more normal one for accepting of both, of all sexes, of all, of all diversity. Um, I felt very lucky um, spending 10 years on the board of my Swedish bank because, you know, the Swedes, I would say if I could be born again, I'd like to be born Swedish. Um, they, <laughs> they really the do. Knitwear, Penny, it's the knitwear. <laughs> <laughs> but they really do. I mean, there just isn't any question around paternity and maternity. You know, there just isn't any question by anyone in society that that will be shared. And that by the time the child is one, they will then be taken care of in a very, very well um, provided for nursery and so it really does mean that the work environment is one in which men and women can absolutely take whatever career path they they wish to pursue uh, in in an equal manner which is which is fabulous great so I wonder just to follow up on on, on that or to link perhaps this this kind of topic back to the original topic I think you all talked about the importance of mentoring um, and sponsors and as I think most of you've indicated in your conversation those have primarily been men because it's always been men who've been senior to yourself so I, I guess how can um, people identify um, the right kind of mentor for them whether it's you know um, women looking for for mentors from senior male leaders or whether it's uh, young men graduates you know wanting to access um, uh, mentoring from people like yourself so, can you give us can you give us any tips on on how how you go out about making those relationships and connections? Well, at the thirty percent club, we do a lot of mentorship. Now, it's not it's not the graduate level, but it's actually mentoring um, women to get on boards. And the thing that I'm the reason I'm mentioning this is because we have two and a half thousand people going through the thirty percent mentorship program at the moment. And the great thing about it is that mentees from one company are mentored by people in another company. So when, it, when each company comes forward, they kind of put forward 10 mentors and 10 mentees, and then all the companies are jumbled up. So, uh, you know, I could be mentoring somebody from British Airways and somebody else could be, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't know, British Aerospace could be mentoring somebody from um, Lloyds Bank and things like this. I, I, the reason I mention this is that often it's good to have a mentor that's not inside your own company, um, but somebody that you trust. I'm sure Penny was talking about that she talked to people that she trusted to share ideas. And often that's really helpful to have somebody outside so that they're not involved in the local politics or that certainly not if you have somebody in your own company don't have somebody in the in your own line management because it can be very hampering about having really honest conversations with people which is definitely what you need in a mentorship relationship and then the other thing i'd say is you've got to have chemistry if you don't really connect with that person and they don't connect with you very hard for them to help you and very hard for you to listen to what they say or to talk to them freely. And so when you're selecting people, it is a bit like dating, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, I guess you guys might, um, the students, I mean, use dating sites and so on, and you're looking at people about their attributes before you meet them. Um, and so this kind of thing is really important. So just building on Anne's idea about going outside, uh, the other thing that I always encourage, and actually it's one of the proudest things that recently has happened to me as a mum, so Alex is 25, and I always encourage graduates to find something outside of work which will give you a chance to try out your leadership skills, because you can probably, in not-for-profit work, um, do, you know, influence even more than maybe you can as a as a graduate starting in a career. So Alex, uh, my 25 year old this season has just become club captain for cricket. Uh, and the club's about 500 people strong. And so, you know, he has to lead a management committee. 
Um, they're all significantly older than him. And it's just giving him a chance to try out his leadership skills and his ability to influence people who are different from him. And, uh, you know, I would say take every chance you can to do to to build your experience base. Don't think it's only in your workplace because there's many things you can do outside the workplace which will really contribute to developing your career. I agree with that, Penny. And my 26-year-old who works in the marketing department for Amazon, she has her own theatre company. There you she go. Productions has put yes. on Edinburgh Fringe and has had things in theatres in London. Um, and um, exactly the same thing, management. It Set is. Up your own company. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's, I uh, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think if I just reflect back to, um, you know, when I was trying to make partner in, in Accenture and, and it felt very, uh, very difficult. And, you know, the, most of the men, or most of the partners were men and I was trying to sort of work my way through the system. And I, did, I would say um, there, there was some advice, a, a good it was a mentor to me to, to a large extent, but it gave me some advice which I've never forgotten, which is, uh, Alison, he said, uh, most of these partners have egos. I was like, well, yeah, tell me something I don't know, you know, and uh, he said, well, you know, but if you ask them for advice and if you ask them for help, they will fall over backwards um, to, 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 to help you. And um, it was something that maybe they made me stop because up to that point, I'd not really been asking for advice. I'd been asking for, you know, I don't know really what I was doing, quite honestly, but I, I probably wasn't framing it as asking for advice or help. So I switched to um, asking a couple of the ones who I, I felt, you know, I, I knew well enough. And, and sure enough, it has been a valuable lesson and I still do it today. You know, there is, um, there is something very important and powerful about asking for advice, um, asking for help, asking for coaching, uh, because the advice and coaching that you can often get, people will really uh, go up, go out of their way to help and support you. So it might not be a formal mentor, but it's certainly something that I think can take you a long way uh, in, in getting um, through the, the, the myriad of sort of uh, navigations on your career, uh, asking for advice, asking for help, asking for, for support. Thank you. I, I think that in conversation um, section has been really fantastic. And I think, I, you know, just to summarise, I think what I took from the three topics we discussed, uh, the advice seemed to basically be being build relations both inside and outside of your organisations, take risks and don't be afraid of failure. And if it all goes wrong or you're unhappy in what you're doing, then take another and or change the boss, which uh, I'm, I'm certainly going to take, take that wave with me. And I'm sure I'm sure the participants have also take, taken many of the things as well. Um, so what I want to do now is is to to thank you again for, for those contributions, but, but to move on to the next section, which is an opportunity for um, some of our graduates to, to ask questions. So I want to start firstly with um, questions that have been submitted in advance. So, so Catherine... Yeah. Jill, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Um, I think it was a very good idea to turn off all the cameras because it has helped with the sound. But could I just suggest that perhaps it might be nice as you invite a graduate to ask a question that they switch their camera on to ask the question because it would be nice to see them. And then perhaps if they could switch them off afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to start by asking Catherine Mortlock, can you ask your question on the impact of COVID? And as Liz has just suggested, if you want to turn your camera on, when you ask the question, um, uh, you know, and while you're hearing your answers and then and then turn it off when we move to the next question. Thank you. Hello, um, thank you very much. Um, so my question is for all three of you. Um, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic um, and like we've seen the increase in remote and flexible working um, could have a positive or a negative impact on the amount of women being appointed to senior positions? I think that it can have both. Um, I think the flexible working uh, is something that women fought for for a long time and that it, it will stay. But unfortunately, um, 
we're in a situation now where the schools had also been shut and I don't know, you know, what's going to happen over the next 12 months. And it could well be that women feel pressurized to step out of the workplace because they're finding it very hard to have a family at home and continue working. And certainly, you know, the New York Times had an article about that not so long ago. Um, However, longer term, I think the fact that, you know, we have the ability to have flexible working and just the way that you, you and I and everybody's talking to each other now, um, I think that helps women longer term, especially when you're back to a normal situation of normal childcare, normal schools and all the rest of it, then it could be fantastic. So, Catherine, uh, one of the businesses I run is called the Gym Group. So we have 184 gyms. Of course, they were shut for COVID. Uh, we have had to downsize, so we've taken um, around about uh, 50 heads out of uh, the organization. Uh, and I required the management team to do that at the same time as increasing diversity. Because I said, quite often what happens is you've got very good women, but you don't have places to, to put them. And so I said, this is the chance to actually give women some more responsibility and take out some of the dead wood that sits in any organization. And so um, actually we've managed to increase our diversity quite well at senior levels um, during, the, during the pandemic. Uh, and I do think the whole work from home has demonstrated that there are many different ways of being able to work and, and be effective. I mean, we do need to get together as social human beings. Um, you know, this has to come to an end. You can't, it, it's very difficult for new starters to an organization to start, you know, in a, in a kind of Zoom world. So we do need to get back to being in person, but um, it, it has demonstrated that there are many different ways of being able to work. And, and Jill, I mean, in the interest of time, I, I don't have a huge amount uh, else to say. I, I agree with both the points that Anne and Penny have uh, have made. Um, and, you know, from, from our perspective, um, diversity and inclusion will not be suffering as a consequence of COVID. In fact, we will look to continue to accelerate it um, at all levels of, of the organisation, for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for your question, Catherine. Can I now invite Christopher Unsworth? You have a question about female role models, I think. Can I ask you to reveal yourself and ask you a question? Hi, uh, I'd just like to firstly say thank you for sort of taking the time to speak to us. It's sort of been really great to hear from you and hear your stories. Um, so my question was, it kind of sounds from what you've been saying that most of your mentors sort of were men, um, but I was sort of wondering in your career, uh, did you have women in senior positions to look up to? And I know a couple of you have touched on this already, but how do you hope to inspire the next generation of women in the boardroom? I didn't have any women that were senior to me in my career until very, very late, late on. Uh, although uh, Margaret Thatcher was actually prime minister when I was young, when I was 22. And... Um, and of course, I was staunch Labour because I'm from the Northeast. And quite honestly, if you put a donkey up, we would vote Labour. So it wouldn't make any difference. And uh, But I met her. She came to my research station because she's a chemist herself. And uh, and I was really actually impressed by what she, she was like. I mean, she was very charismatic, very engaging and very intelligent. Um, and I kind of changed my view a little bit as a result of meeting her. So... You know, I, I could say that she was a little bit of a role model, uh, though I didn't agree with her politics mainly. Um, but um, but uh, in terms of leaving a legacy and helping other people, um, then I think this is very important. And personally, I'm very involved uh, in my own company about lead, leading the way on all of the gender initiatives that we take. Um, and one of the great things that our company has done is actually publish our global gender pay gap this year. And not many companies have done that on a global basis. And it's 0.92 cents to the dollar. Now, that's not because we pay men more than women. That's because we've got more senior men in the company than women. Um, but I think a company going out and doing that and saying to the shareholders, we're being completely transparent and we're telling you how it is and we want to improve this, 
that is a massive step forward. So when you're senior in a company, you can influence at that level and really change the way things work. Yeah, the, the women I've worked with, um, I mean, like Anne, not many kind of role models. Um, I too met Maggie Thatcher and feel as though she influenced my career too. Um, I think probably the most influential woman on my career was probably um, Anita Roddick, who was the founder and entrepreneur of The Body Shop. I was her first ever independent director. And as soon as I got joined the board, Anita and Gordon Roddick decided they might like to buy the business back. And so we were then on different sides of the table with them trying to persuade me on behalf of other shareholders that they should uh, buy the business, which they didn't succeed in doing. And so working through that, but then being able to travel with her to Kathmandu where we were planting banana trees and so forth. I mean, it was just an extraordinary experience. And so um, she definitely has influenced me. I've worked with some terrific women more recently on boards because it is becoming so much more balanced. Um, and, you know, like Anne, I do plenty of mentoring. And I suppose we're all now setting an expectation that if, if as leaders you're not um, leading diverse teams, then you're probably not leading. So, you know, please vacate the seat. <laughs> yes, and, and, and similarly, um, there weren't many female role models that I was um, able to look up to in the organisations I've, I've been in. But, um, you know, I would say one that had uh, two that have had real big influence on me, who don't probably know that I exist, but, um, you know, I know that they exist. One was a, a lady called Nicola Horlicks, uh, Horrocks, who was um, who wrote a book. And I read that book when I was the age of 16. Um, and it really inspired me, actually, to say, actually, you know, you can have a career and you can have children. Um, and that was something that I felt very passionately about. I wanted to be a mum and I wanted to also, um, you know, have a, have a great career. And that gave me an inspiration that, did, that you know, this was possible. Uh, the other one was actually Sheryl Sandberg. Um, I happened to be reading her book again at the time when um, I was offered the role of vice chair of industry and then my son was seven months old and it was lean in. And I thought, if I don't lean in now, then, you know, when, when will I? Um, and um, so I think it is really critical to have um, people who, who can, who look like you, uh, that, that you can look up to, whether they're in your organisation or outside of your organisation. And from my perspective, um, I look at my daughter now and I think, gosh, what an amazingly talented uh, young girl she is. She's 12 uh, and she's, she's phenomenal. Um, and I just want to do my small bit in my own way to now, you know, continue to push on to make sure that the world of work that she enters into in, you know, the next 10, 15 years is a world that she feels that she can take the strides and, and some of the invisible barriers that I face, that Anne's face, that Penny have faced are no longer there, that, you know, those barriers have been moved on. Uh, and I think it is important that um, as, as women leaders, uh, we make sure that we're doing all the things that we need to do to, to push through those invisible barriers and remove them. Brilliant. Thank Thanks very much, Christopher. That, that's great. Thank you. And then lastly, um, Emma Daffin-Powell, can I ask you to ask your question about the choice of workplace? Thank you. Hi, um, so thank you again. Um, I was wondering how you chose workplaces that best allowed or helped you to succeed. <laughs> It, it's actually a lot about the people that you're going to work with. And so, you know, when you are interviewed, you will get a sense of, is this the kind of culture? Do, do I feel as though I can fit here? Are these the kind of people? Um, I think, I mean, I've, I've worked for a lot of consumer businesses, and that means that it's very easy to connect with what the product is and be able to understand what the, what the service is going to be, what the customer offering is going to be. And I think, you know, I, I personally couldn't work for a tobacco company. You know, there are, there are some things that would just be off limits for me. So you've got your own personal value system and then you have to go out, explore and meet. You know, there's so much you can learn about different companies now from the Internet. Um, you know, I think when we were all first interviewing, it was quite hard to know, you know, who is EY. Um, nowadays, there is so much that you can access to really find out the kind of company and the kind of leadership that you'll be 
um, receiving, but um, you, you know, you, you should be able to find a good fit. Yes, and I don't know if I, I think I wasn't perhaps as thoughtful uh, as you're being. So thank you for that thoughtfulness in, in terms of thinking about the type of organisation. Uh, but culture of an organisation is certainly very, very important. But I would also say going forward or now, what is critical is if a, if a company doesn't have a purpose beyond making money, then it's an organisation that I personally would not want to, to work for. I think the broader uh, impact on society that business has, uh, the broader impact on how it treats its people, the impact on um, you know, how, it, how it engages with its customers, those things for me matter uh, as much as you know the, the financial side of it. So any organisation that isn't living a purpose beyond making money is an organisation that I would not want to uh, to work for. And I think, and I think maybe um, Penny said it earlier that you've got to get up and you've got to really want to love going to work, right? Now, it's not as if you're going to do something absolutely fantastically interesting every day. In fact, we all know <laughs> that huge portions of your day are spent doing pretty uninteresting things. <laughs> but every now and again, you know, there's something that appeals to you deeply about the work that you're doing. I actually fell into my first job because um, I was at Newcastle University doing my master's and the research station for British Gas actually rang the university and said, we want a statistician to come and design experiments for engineers and physicists and so on. And could you send us someone? And they sent me along for the interview. That's how I got my first job. <laughs> but of course, as soon as I walked in there, I had a feeling that I loved the feeling of the place. I could imagine myself coming here every day and being there part of the environment um, and I think in today's world my daughters I told you got a job with Amazon recently and my god the the recruitment process I mean it was hours and you met lots of people from the company and they had a list of a hundred questions that they could ask you you know which like was pretty scary I thought but but the thing was, it told you a lot about their culture and she knew what she was kind of getting into, if you see what I mean. And that, that is the point about today. You do know what you're getting into um, and, you know, go for those things that inspire you and make you feel good, make you feel it's somewhere you want to be. And as Alison said, you probably don't want to be somewhere that's not fit, you know, with your values and your purpose and and so on and not somewhere that doesn't have any purpose i i find it hard to come across a company like that these days but there are one or two out there but as as you know as we move out of covid and we care about climate change and so on you're going to see many many more companies really laying out their stall of this is our culture this is what we're investing in this is what we think about climate change this is what we think about all of the sustainability goals in general and you'll be able to judge whether this is really a fit for you and and my last last final quick word would also be you know take your whole self to the interview be be properly authentic and you know if you've done ballet or if you've done art or you enjoy music or whatever it is it's just great to talk about those things too because you know businesses need personalities we are all human beings so don't don't think you've just got to be you know serious and business focused take your whole self to the interview i agree with that penny because my interview with british gas the head of the maths department said to me well um do you know about stochastic processes and i said no about them i'm absolutely shit hot on stochastic <laughs> processes <laughs> And needless to say, I got the job and I am quite good. I was quite good at them. But I mean... <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Fantastic advice. Thanks so much. And also thank you to, um, to Catherine, Christopher and Emma. Great questions and, and prompted some, some, some really great insights there. So I just want to hand over now to Lizzie and Charlotte, who have been triaging the questions that have been appearing in the chat. And so um, uh, and they're going to pick up and facilitate any final questions that have appeared in the chat. 
Hi, yeah, so in the interest of time, let's let's see how many we can uh, squeeze in. But uh, Ronak, uh, I would like to invite you to ask your question on embracing failure. Oh, Ronak, you're, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah, I just realized that, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, my question is, so we have been talking quite a lot about how to avoid failures and how to minimize the risks to maximize the output. My question is that early careers in my in my life, what I've also witnessed during internships, once I've made a failure, it kind of puts me back because I'm really in the in the beginning of my career. So how do you embrace failure, especially when you are young and when you are naive, when you are in the very beginning of your career? How do you embrace and look at it positively, considering you are a minuscule part of the whole organization, so you feel that you have completely ruined your career? So what's your thought on that? You, you've just got to think of it as a learning a learning curve. Um, and as I say, I, when I talk to young people, encourage them to think about things that didn't go as well as they'd really hoped, because that's the only way you learn. And that's the only way that you really reach out and reach your full potential. So you do, I mean, obviously catastrophic failures, let's try and avoid them. <laughs> but otherwise, <laughs> let's go for, you know, manageable failure where you can turn around and say, I learned, I know how I do it differently next time. And it was worth trying. Um, I, I, I think, you know, this point that Alison was making about ask somebody to help you is really yeah. important, really important. And if you feel you're failing, then reach out and ask. I've got to start. When I first started work, I was asked to write a research paper. I can't remember what the subject was, but I hadn't written anything for years because I was a mathematician. And, um, and I, I wrote it and I handed it to my boss and he looked at me and he said, you can't actually write, can you? <laughs> and I went, well, no, I was never very good at English. And he said, don't worry about it. I'm sending you on a writing course. And he sent me the next week on a writing course, technical writing course. And they also taught me to speed read on that course. And I was 22 years old and I was taught how to read a paper and retain it and throw it away. And you know what, later on when emails came out, I could speed read through my emails and just delete them in a way that I could never have done if this guy, if I hadn't failed to produce a good paper the first time he asked me. So that's an example of, you know, a very early failure that resulted in something that really helped me. Okay. Thank you. Rather than me repeating, do you want to, just to see if we can whiz through some questions in the interest of time? Sure, yeah. Um, Fiona, would you like to um, uh, ask, uh, ask your question to Anne, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and you mentioned that there is a point in a woman's career where she may tend to step back and where men may tend to step up the ladder and accelerate. How can businesses encourage more women to reach higher positions? Yes. Um, well, first of all, this, this tends to happen at the first level of management. And I think that it can be for different reasons. Sometimes women, um, you know, decide that they don't want to push uh, hard when they're having kids and they you know, they go to part time um, and uh, and sometimes they move jobs because they're following their partner around the world. And that happens the other way around as well, can be lots of reasons. But I think the important thing is to remember that as you're making different decisions at different points in your life, um, you know, they're not final. And if I can say, you know, often it's happening in your 30s. And if you're my age at 63, then something that you did at 33 is 30 years ago and so your you know your career path is much much longer than that so i think what you really have to think about is whatever decision you're making at this moment in time it's reversible you can do something quite different in the future if you choose to and if you feel that you want to sort of power on at that particular stage find people who can help you accelerate and make jumps very quickly um, and and all of this can happen uh, and don't be afraid that something that you do in your 30s will hamper you for your, the rest of your life it doesn't have to be that way thank you great um can we have do we have time for one final question lizzie or would you like to round, uh, round up 
I think we could take one more. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure if this applicant has got, uh, sorry, if this um, uh, uh, boardroom joiner has got her full name here, but Nkeshi maybe? Have you got a question? Hi, yeah. Um, I'm just gonna bring up my question now. <laughs> it, it was about um, when you realized your potential in your careers and how that influenced how far you went, because I think all your achievements have been quite unique and not things which are typically suggested to young women or any woman at all really to pursue. So were there any kind of pivotal moments when you knew or did it more just happen along the way? You know, I, I think it's that's a really good question. But for me, you know, I feel as though I've done the things that kind of suited me along the journey. And I've never stopped to think that it's been a particular moment or a particular you know, I've never thought, gosh, I might have it in me to do X, Y, Z. Um, and then it's only really when you start to get into the age that Anne and I are and you start being involved in things like the 30% Club and other things that you realise that actually, yes, you do have some role model responsibilities. And actually, yes, what's been achieved is quite, you know, important or unusual or whatever, even though to me, it just feels like me doing the things that came naturally to me and, and made me happy. And so I, I think, you know, obviously running Coke at the age of 30 was unusual and gave me that confidence. Um, and I suppose that's probably the most important kind of promotion I got in, in life, if you like. Um, but, you know, I, I don't look back. I, I can look back at that now. I didn't at the time think that it was particularly unusual because I felt I was ready. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that, you know, belief in yourself, I, I likewise I don't think I've ever I've ever thought I've topped out or I'm not good enough I've just sort of enjoyed what I'm doing um, believed in myself and you know trusted that um, trusted that what I'm doing if I'm enjoying it and I'm, I'm feeling challenged and I'm feeling stretched then it's a good thing um, but I've never ever personally ever looked and said I want that job I've just sort of um, enjoyed what I'm doing and as long as it's challenging me uh, then um, I felt like I've been in a good place. I would say that, you know, again, I didn't sort of look up when I was um, in my 20s and say, I want to be the CEO, I want to be running a big company or anything like that. But what I did do, though, was I was working in British Gas and, and they, they moved from a, nation, a nationalized industry to a privatized industry. And at that time, I saw that the people with finance qualifications were getting higher jobs in the company than the people who were engineers. Originally, it was run by an engineer, but then it started to be these financy types. And I kind of thought to myself, my God, I'm in the wrong field. You know, I need to switch. I need to be some sort of banker or something. And so I guess there was always something in the back of my mind that, you know, I wanted to be at the top of a company and I was willing to change disciplines to what I thought would be a better bet. Um, and so making those kind of broad decisions can help you long term. Fantastic, thank you, all of you. I'm really conscious that the clock has beaten this. I know there are, there are many other kind of questions that were being submitted, but can I just say to Anne, Penny and Alison, a huge thank you. You've shared with us lots of really positive advice, particularly around being authentic and finding mentors and about learning to be confident and project yourself going forward. But some of the experiences and insights that you shared with us reminded me of the definition of success that Winston Churchill uh, has used. And he famously said that the definition of success is the ability to go from failure to failure with no, le no loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> and, and something you've shared, the importance of being resilient, that failure is a part of success. And, and also, I think all three of you this evening have shared such boundless energy and enthusiasm with us as well. And I, I think that also speaks to your point about the points you've made during the discussion, being yourselves and being passionate and really committed. So, so thank you, all of you.